It's a real pleasure for me to be here with you uh, tonight in Sydney uh, to tell you about this game we developed for about three years called Beyond Two Souls. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with my studio or my work, uh, Quantic Dream is a French studio based in Paris and uh, we work on, for 16 years, on experiences based on interactive storytelling and emotion. So we don't make games where you shoot, you run, you jump on platforms. We actually create experiences where we put you in the shoes of the main protagonist of the story and depending on your choices and your decisions, you will change the way the story unfolds. So this is really a, a different type of experiences than, than you know, most video games out there. So our last game was called Heavy Rain and um, it was about the relationship that a father can have with his son. And the, the, the game basically has this very simple question, how far are you prepared to go to save someone you love? And to our big surprise, I must confess, uh, the game's been a real critical but also a commercial success. Uh, it's sold about 3.2 million units worldwide, just on one platform, which is in our industry considered as a, a commercial success. And for us, it was something very interesting because the game was so different from other games out there um, that it was very interesting to see that we could convince gamers actually to get interested in an experience that would be, wouldn't be based on violent actions in loop, uh, where the goal wouldn't be to kill people or to, to steal cars or to jump on platforms, but actually just an experience that would just be based on emotions, choices and consequences. So today we're here to talk about this game called Beyond Two Souls, which is by far um, the most ambitious title developed by my studio in 16 years. Um, it's very ambitious at many levels. On a visual point of view, everything you saw is running in real-time 3D on a PlayStation 3 console. So uh, we worked very hard on the graphics. Um, we try to tell a better story. We try to have a better game and, and interlace the story and the gameplay in a better way. But also, we, we developed the game in a different way. Um, first of all, working with um, very talented actors, including Ellen Page, that you maybe saw in Juno or in Inception, and of course, Willem Dafoe, um, that doesn't need to be presented, but he <laughs> was in Platoon. Uh, he was in Mississippi Burning, one of my favorite films. It was, of course, in Spider-Man and many, many, many other great films. And this collaboration between a video game company and talents of this caliber um, is really a premiere um, for our industry. So uh, uh, tonight we are going to talk a little bit how this experienced, uh, this experience actually worked, how we worked together, uh, both on a technical point of view, what are the technologies that we used, also how we shot this different type of experience, but also um, how it affects storytelling and where we can go from there. So Beyond, in a nutshell, is the story of this young woman called Jodie Holmes, who was a link with an invisible entity since the day she was born. So she doesn't know if this thing is, you know, um, um, a, a soul or, or the, maybe the spirit of someone who passed away, but this presence is always there around her. So the game will tell the story through 15 years of her life. So we'll see her as a little girl, we'll see her as a teenager, we'll see her as an adult, and we'll see how she evolves, how she changes through the years. And the story will be told in chronological disorder. So we'll have different moments of her life that are mixed. So you will see a scene where she's adult, then she's a kid, then she's adult, then she's a teenager. All this is told in, dis in chronological disorder, which is another um, challenge for, for, for storytelling, of course. So um, this game is also about different themes uh, than the themes you usually find in video games. It's about growing, it's about learning, it's about accepting who you are, but it's also about mourning, it's about death, and it's about what's on the other side. So again, the type of topics and themes that we don't usually find in games, because the idea beyond an experience like Beyond 
is really to make you feel emotions that are usually rarely found in video games. You know, video games, most of the time, they are really focused on action, on adrenaline, stress, tension, frustration, competition. Um, but when you look at films, when you look at TV series, when you look at um, theater, literature, or life in general, there are many other emotions that we can find on these mediums, but not in games. So I'm interested in all the other emotions that you can find in films but not yet in a video game. So before we go into more details about how we created this game, let's see how everything started. I was confronted with the loss of someone in my family close to me, and it was really a shocking experience. I wanted to tell a different story and not talk about death the usual way, I would say, but really deal with death as a physical reality and that can be explained. David Cage's vision is always one that is innovative and highly challenging. So each time we start out on a project, we see those giant mountains in front of us and think, oh my God, how are we going to do that? It took over a year to write Beyond. It was really challenging a collaboration because David is really passionate about writing and he always wants to push the envelope. You know, the concept is huge and there's, you know, incredible action sequences and locations all over the world. and. But there's also this like beautiful drama within it. One of the challenges of doing this is because the player participates in the scenario, the possibilities of where the story goes is fantastic. We ended up with 2,000 pages document and we realized we had a very big project in our hands that would be very challenging to produce. It was a journey, right? Writing Beyond was, was a journey by itself. I like being around interesting people that are really innovators and are passionate about what they're doing. And I had that sense in how they approached me and what I saw in the design and how they were talking about how they wanted to shoot. It was strange because it felt so foreign to me, because it sort of felt like jumping off a cliff a little bit. Maybe that's just what I did. I just sort of jumped, I guess. It was exciting. You know, it was exciting in the sense that it, it was unusual for me. Everything was so unusual. I'm a true gamer. When I got the call and I was gonna meet David, I was beside myself. When a project is someone's baby and they put so much time and so much heart into it, you really see it. And this is such a developed story and this is gonna make you feel and, and have emotion and go through a journey. So it's, it's something I really wanna get into. I think that's the other thing that's so exciting about this game is this female protagonist, not a female protagonist who's like, Sorry guys, like it has like big boobs and a tank top, you know, and is like running around with a gun and I feel grateful that I can be involved with playing this female protagonist in this video game. It was really important amount of pages to shoot. In films usually they shoot about two to three minutes a day. We had to shoot above twenty minutes. It's been shockingly emotional. You just don't stop. You just go and go and go and go. But I've kind of really enjoyed that experience. It's been like weirdly kind of freeing. You walk by the performance capture space, and it looks so tiny and so simple. And you look at that and you say, my God, all that stuff happened in that space today. When I say happened, it happened in your imagination and it happened in your intention. But it's, it's a powerful feeling. It's so amazing that this is what I'm getting to do. I can't sleep at night. I go home and I'm just so excited that I'm coming back tomorrow. Developing this game has been an amazing journey uh, by itself and we use some very specific techniques and some of them you may be familiar with. First of all we wanted to recreate the clones of the actors and the game. We didn't want just to have the voice in the game we wanted their face, their movement, their body, their voice. We wanted their performance. But we wanted characters that would look exactly like William, William Dafoe and Ellen Page. So we used a technique called 3D scanning. We bought this expensive stuff to make actually 3D pictures of um, the faces and bodies of the actors to recreate them in a very precise way in the game not just their shape, but the, the texture of their skin and, and have even the details of their hands, not just the face, it's the entire body. So we could recreate an entire clone of these two characters, of these two real persons 
end the game. And then we used um, a technology that you're probably familiar with called performance capture. Performance capture was used in Avatar, James Cameron's film, um, and it's this technology that allows you to capture um, the body movements, the facial animations, and the voice of an actor in real time. So you can really just capture the performance and apply the animation to the 3D clone that you have created to get a 3D performance in a way. And, and this is a great challenge for any video game developer. What you need to understand is that when you're James Cameron doing Avatar, um, you can run, you can really calculate one frame per week and there are 24 frames in a, in a second and that's okay because everything is pre-rendered in the end you just see the results in a theater but you can't interact, you can't change what's going on. What we do is calculating 30 frames a second on a piece of hardware that is $299 um, actually it's a PlayStation 3 30 frames a second so the quality is all the work is really different but we, we want we need this because of the interactivity because the player can change what is going on so we captured this performance and um, in cinema they use quite invasive systems with helmets and cameras sometimes projectors in the face sometimes backpack uh, everything is wired everything is heavy and quite intrusive sometimes they have glasses we wanted to um, have something that would be totally non-intrusive uh, we wanted our actors to be basically free no wire, no helmets, no cameras in the face, no projector, no backpack, nothing, just bare acting. This is really what we wanted. And um, so we developed the technology to do this. We also developed a specific technology to capture the movements of the eyes just by placing very small markers around the eyes just to see how the little muscles that you have under the eye move. Because when your eye turns, I mean, these little muscles move, and we can detect these movements and know how your eyes moved and recreate that in the game. So this is why uh, the first people who played the game really uh, often reported this, oh, the eyes are amazing. Well, it's just, they were just captured on um, a real, uh, real actors. Let's have a look actually of, about how we worked in performance capture with these actors. <laughs> Every second of movement you see in Beyond is motion capture, ranging from you know simple in-game motions, walking, turning, all the way to uh, stunts, fights, four-person fights on train roofs, to performance capture, to full facial and body capture at the same time. It's not your call, Aiden. I can do what I want. It is unusual to go in and wear the suit and have these dots on your face. And it's interesting because you're kind of like limited in certain ways, but you're also way more free than when you shoot a movie. I mean, you could kind of do whatever you want. The games we make at Quantic Dream are based in reality. Everything that actually happens in real life has to happen in our game, and the only practical way to get that is to capture the real thing. We have to rebuild the world in out of cardboard and tape and foam. We have to make sure it matches the what's in the game, and we have to make sure that we can actually capture with it because there are limitations to motion capture. So we have these very strange props that look really miserable, but they respect exactly the dimensions of the real set in 3D in the game, so all the contacts are fine. We can't use a car door in motion capture because it's shiny and it's really heavy. We can't see through it, so we have to build the approximate of a car door, but it has to at least have some of the real properties of a car door because just closing a cardboard doesn't play the same as a real cardboard. You're in a car, and it's this ridiculous looking thing made out of two by fours with a, you know, steering wheel. I'm a guy that likes to, when I'm going through a casual environment, I like to have my hands in my pocket. Well, your performance capture shoe doesn't have pockets. So we created these Velcro straps that became my pockets that I would have something to put my hands in. It's like pure imagination. Not just the fact that you're 
you know, shooting a scene in a submarine. Cool. cool. <laughs> I was sure he'd love that. <laughs> or you're getting briefed about this uh, intense mission that you're about to go on in Somalia. Jamal Sheikh Sharif. It's like being a seven-year-old with your best friend and you're pretending that the, the world's gonna end and the bad guys are coming and we have to jump from couch to couch and avoid the lava. I think that that's also what makes it challenging but also really incredible and like raw. Everything becomes kind of uh, bare and essential but also it's sort of just disturbing sometimes. You know, when you're eating in a scene and say we're eating pizza, it's like a little piece of triangle cardboard that, thank God, says pizza on it, or else I would not know what it is. We build the helicopter where there is this uh, very intense dialogue between Judy and Clayton. So everything was on wheels and we were moving the helicopter. Because I trusted you! Performance capture is digital acting. The trickiest part of performance capture is, is the preparation. It's, it's getting people ready to perform. Uh, depending on how many actors you have, it takes a while to put the 90 plus markers on the face. They all have to be placed specifically for them to work right on the rig. So you have 88 dots, these beads all over your face. Not only that, but you got all these hard ball like uh, Velcro things all over your body as well. It's going to pose a little bit of a challenge. I mean, okay. all these little balls. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fuck! <laughs> I, I got like 10 bruises in my arm! Everything's very refined because they want to have a vocabulary to play with. So you try to be the material. You try to uh, give them as much as you can. You know, game, we have dozens of hours of animation. <laughs> Capturing everything oh. demanded an enormous amount of focus of the team to shoot almost every day during one year. And then, of course, treating all this data, bringing it to uh, the character in the game. Jody, Jody, where are you? Turn back. The game itself really requires emotion and subtlety, and I think there's no other way to capture all that than the way we're doing it. You know, they rely on each other. We couldn't get this performance without performance capture, and it wouldn't be worth getting unless it was from these people. It's a really great mix of technology and talent. Yeah, a mix of uh, technology and talent. This is uh, really what we try to achieve with, uh, with Beyond. You saw it's very specific the way we shot with actors because when they arrive, it's basically an empty stage. There is nothing there. There is no environment. There are no props most of the time, no wardrobe. Uh, it's just this empty place. And actually what is sometimes a little bit disorienting for actors is the fact that there is not even a camera. The first question they ask is, where is the camera? And actually there is no camera because we film 360 degrees. There, there are actually 65 optical cameras all around you, f filming you, because actually filming is done in a second phase. So first we work with the actors, we capture the animations, then we place the cameras. And actors have to make, it's a very interesting exercise for them because they need really to rely on their imagination and it's really, as William Dafoe said, it's really bare acting. You are really, it's just you in this silly suit, and all you can trust is your imagination, the script, the director helping you, and of course, the other actors. But it's really about acting in its pure, pure form. And there are many, many other challenges, but we would need the night to, to go <laughs> through all of them. Uh, maybe we'll have the, the opportunity to talk about, about it uh, a little bit later. Um, just to, as a conclusion, we try to create with Beyond um, an emotional journey into the life of this character. Uh, we tried to create an interactive experience, actually more than just another video game. Uh, we really tried to put you in the shoes of, of this young woman and um, hopefully make you like her in a way because you, you will feel like you know her since she was a kid because you've been with her in the happy and difficult moments of her life. You know uh, what she went through and where she comes from. And uh, my hope is that by the time you will be done with the game and you turn off your console, you'll feel uh, a little bit sad because you may never see her again. So that's really the goal. <laughs> to start this discussion, I might start with uh, our international guests, just because, you know, why not? It seems like a reasonable line in the sand to draw. Um, so um, one thing that I was I've been fascinated, David, in listening to you is the detail and the... In that video that we cut to, there was a voiceover from you which said something 
uh, profound had happened to you in your life. Um, and so this story is born out of a personal experience that clearly needed telling. Um, I then want to fast forward that idea through to the notion of Ellen Page. So we're talking about a leading lady on a journey that you want to take us on where we feel sad when we turn the game off. And so you ring Suzanne, so you reach out into the world, out of your own head. What's a conversation that goes on between a guy wanting to make a game about something profoundly moving and a casting director who is looking at the human face every day of her life, wondering what stories it can offer up? How does that conversation play out? Well, it was two different moments, I guess, because I think that a year uh, happened between the moment where I had the idea and the moment where I gave a call to, to Suzanne to talk about the cast. Yeah. Actually, for me, um, my previous game, Heavy Rain, was an important moment as a writer because it was the first game on which I realized that it was possible to create a game about something personal, about something that I experienced and, and something that moved me. So my previous game was my, ex my experience being a young father and this relationship with my son. And, and once you've done this step, it's very difficult to go back and talk about, you know, um, things you don't have a clue about. And so for Beyond, it was it, the idea of talking about death was very obvious. It's, this sad thing happened to me in my life. And I just felt I had to, to talk about it in a way and make something positive out of it. So um, I worked for a year. This is usually the time it takes me to write a script. And um, one of the first images, I, 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 I'm, I'm used to take images uh, on the internet just to pick them up, just to have someone to look at when I'm writing. And, and one of the first images that I found was a picture of Ellen Page in uh, one of the indie films that she did um, when she was 16 or something. And, um, she had something incredible in her eyes. I mean, she was full of anger in a way and strength and really she, she, she felt really angry. But at the same time, she's this tiny girl and she seems so fragile and vulnerable. So, and you got that from a still shot? Yeah, it was just, just on the internet type and looking for images. This is, I, I put, you know, tons of images in my script just to help the team to visualize what I mean. Uh, and um, so I, I started writing and, and uh, as I was writing and got more and more images of Ellen Page in my script and what was very interesting to me also was that she had, she had this very unique feel but at the same time she shoots films since she's six so um, I had I could find images of her at different ages and different attitudes and, and that's great for a game that is about the 15 years of the life of someone to have so many references and each time I, I've uh, always found exactly the, the expression that I was looking for uh, in, in my scene. So when I was done with my script after a year, uh, you know, my, my feeling was, okay, only Ellen Page can do it. But, I mean, what are your chances to get Ellen Page in a video game? I mean, it was close to zero. But I started my career working with someone called David Bowie. David Bowie? Yeah, this, this <laughs> David Bowie. I've, I've heard of him. Yeah, this one. <laughs> and actually, when someone like David Bowie told you, yes, I, I'm okay to work with you, then you're not afraid of asking anyone. So I uh, just gave a call to Suzanne and said, okay, well, what can you do about this? And what All do you right. think? So Suzanne, after you told him to take a reality check, <laughs> um, how, how do you, to, that conversation, the conversation that you were used to having with uh, directors of um, or traditional forms of storytelling, film and TV. How did that conversation with Dave, did, did it change or did you find that you were responding to the same sort of creative artist? Were they the same sorts of conversations that you would have with a film and TV director? Um, in television, it's not director-led, it's mm -hmm. producer-led. And with David being a director, writer, producer, he had it all going. Yeah. <laughs> and with his vision, it was exciting to be able to come to the exact terms that he wanted because he said, I want Ellen Page. And I said, well, why not? And I, we discussed the sensibilities of the character and why he felt, for all the reasons that he just said, why she was the best for the role. But I remember there was one thing I asked you. What about the sexual? quality within her because that's not something that we had necessarily seen from her and you felt very confident in that 
sensibility of that she would be able to come oh, yeah. to terms with that. Yeah, definitely. I, I really felt she had everything my character mm -hmm. needed. And, and things that I could see in the games that she made, but also things that I imagined she, she would be able to do. And, yeah. and because it, this, this game, this movie in a sense, is all character driven and story driven, it's very attractive to actors. And we got in touch with Ellen's people, explained the, um, the game and the role, and they were very excited about it. And they also knew of David's work with Heavy Rain, and he was very well thought of in the Hollywood industry. A lot of these kids played those games. <laughs> and she took a meeting with us, and David and Guillaume met with her, and they came back to my office and said, it's her, it's just her. We knew at the moment we saw her. It was very exciting and she felt the same way. Tell me, can I just jump in there? I'm, uh, uh, and I hate to put you on the spot, but I will, can I do it all night? Mm -hmm. um, is there, obviously, you know, you, you've made uh, four, five games now. Um, you've got, you, you know, things are going well, let, let's, let's say. Is there still something in you when you sit down with Ellen Page, Willa Willem Dafoe, do you still feel that you need to explain your credentials as a creative artist if they haven't heard of you? Is there still, is, is there a sense somewhere that you assume these people might look at you in a different light because you come from a gaming background as opposed to a cinema background? I guess I'm talking about a sense of uh, belonging. Oh, you can only be very humble when you go and talk to these people. I mean, uh, the, you know, the film industry is, is something phenomenal for one century and uh, games is just a medium that we try to create right now. It's, it's a very young medium. Um, so uh, yeah, of course, I explain my background, I explain where I come from and how I work and, and also you need to explain that the type of games that you make is maybe not the type of video games that they may know. Uh, because sometimes some people have negative you know, views on video games and think, oh, it's just about violence and it's just about this and that. So you need to explain, oh, it's, it's not this kind of game, it's, it's different. There is a script, there are characters, and, and it's an emotional experience more than anything else. And, uh, and then the dialogue become, becomes very easy, actually. Mm -hmm. And then just one, just, just one last question um, around the actors. Um, so you, you secured Ellen. Congratulations, mm -hmm. and she looks stunning in it. Uh, Willem Dafoe as well. You've got an amazing cast. Um, Suzanne, as you've watched them go through that process and watched them work with David, what were some of the experiences, I guess, that you saw the differences between, or were there any differences between, apart from the fact that you're covered in ping pong balls, um, of working in gaming rather than um, in cinema? Was, was there any, anything to note? I don't think there is any difference. It's all about strong actors knowing their, their tools and being able to get to them quickly. It's like working in theater on stage in a big black box. Um, that's how a lot of actors start out, at least the ones that really love their craft and want to study. And they're in a big black box and they're doing Ibsen or they're doing, uh, I don't know, David. <laughs> um, and just finding the core of who the character is. And all these actors were in touch with that element of being able to make themselves be these people and go through the, the amount of emotions because it's not a linear story. It's not telling it from here to there. It's telling it seven different ways. So they, each actor had to be able to tell the story if they were going to go to die to be happy, to be sad, to just, that's very basic. But it's uh, many emotions that they have to go to and what an exciting thing for these actors to be able to do something like that. No other uh, medium offers that. But actually, I, I felt it was a little bit more challenging to convince actors, N not in the case of Ellen and Willem, but we are a little bit more difficult because not only are we looking for talented actors, of course, like, like a film, as Susan said, but at the same time, you need to convince them to trust you enough to risk their name and their image on, on, on this new medium, not being sure of what the final result is going to be. And also, you need to be careful because, you know, there are, oh, there are always two ways of convincing an actor to join you on a project like this. It's all money 
or a very exciting creative challenge for them. And um, you need to be careful because if you get people who just come for money, you may not get the quality that you're looking for and not the, the journey that you're looking for. And what was just amazing with that and William is that they came, I, I, I could really feel that mm -hmm. um, fr from the start, they were here because that was something they've never done before and they were very excited by the, the, the creative idea behind the game. And uh, I think this is something that, that you can feel playing the game. Hmm. Now, um, Suzanne, you mentioned a moment ago the notion of it being a non-linear story format. So I'll pursue that in just a moment with Bruce. Before I get there, though, I wanted to jump over to Nick. Um, Nick, you've been listening. Um, you're young, 30, hot young director, right, out and about. And presumably over the last sort of 10 years, um, you've had a dream to be a storyteller. And I'm guessing, I uh, might be putting words in your mouth, that the primary forum for your storytelling craft um, has been film and TV. Yeah. Fair enough? Yeah. Um, we've now got another storyteller, very passionate about, obviously, the detail of uh, human experience, mm -hmm. uh, very clear about how he wants an audience to feel. As a young person, do you feel now that you're at a crossroads, do you have more areas now that you think you can play in as a storyteller than just film and TV? So where, where are you at, I guess, in, yeah. in, inside that? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think this is as a guy that plays video games as well, not heaps, but enough. Um, yeah, this is really, really exciting. I think if you've ever watched a TV show or a film and you get to a point and you're like, why did he do that? I wouldn't have done that. Mm. Now you can do it how you do it. Mm -hmm. That's really compelling. And also everybody has their own adventure and their own yeah. journey. I think it's, yeah, you can take a story now and package it up in a different way. It's sort of like the possibilities are endless with this particular platform because it, there's no, here's A, there's B, you go from A to B and that's it. Mm. Now you might jump over and see what's happening over in C. I understand, you can understand that I'd be slightly suspicious of your motivation or, or of your skill set there. Um, the films that you've uh, won Tropfest with um, were run for seven minutes, so that yeah. times out at a seven page script. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote down 2,000 pages <laughs> yeah. um, uh, for the script that you wrote. So there's obviously a, a learning curve there. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm working on 90 at the moment. 90, 90, so you're 90 pages, film. Yeah, and so that's, quite, that's got its own thing. You saw those stacks of scripts, right? Mm. 2,000 pages, yeah. So how does that work? With, with the script, you know, so I, I, again, we'll get to the, to the non-linear thing in a sec, Bruce, because I'm kind of, it starts to bend with my head slightly. Because um, I'm still locked, uh, I must admit, a little bit back in the notion of a hero's journey or an ensemble. Mm drama or, or and so I kind of like this stuff so between the two of you looking at each other now a 2,000 page multifarious here's how it can end or how do you want it to end let's go there position to uh, you know a kind of a you know a flying arrow through time for 90 pages yeah. how, how have you got any questions that you want to well, I'm, I'm pumped because yeah. now I get an extra whoever's good at maths can figure that one out but when you're writing a 90 page script, you're talking to the writers and they're saying, no, that can't happen because we have to get there by then. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So if you turn around and say, well, you can just have another thousand pages and see what you can do. <laughs> All right, okay. So now I'm gonna push over to here. David, so that just sounds like um, uh, sort of laziness masquerading as passion um, when it comes into the editing process. So 2000 pages, but presumably, if you are looking at monitoring these different responses, there has to be as much editing work and that much fat trimmed in a 2,000 page script yeah. as it does for a, a more traditional 90 page. First of all, it's not a competition. It's not the more pages you got, the better. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and <laughs> it, it can be much more difficult to write good seven pages than, than 2,000. So, too kind. honestly, no, 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 honestly. <laughs> Um, so the, the way that works is that when you're a film writer, you write one version of the story. This is your vision. And as a writer, you probably consider different possibilities and different options and say, oh, this could happen or that could happen. But actually, you have to make a choice and to say, no, I'm, I'm choosing this option and this is the only one I'm going to get. So you write one line, but when you're an interactive writer, you don't write one line, you write a narrative space, in a way, in which the player is free to move, so he can tell his own story. So it's not just one version, it's all the possibilities 
uh, in the story. You, you, you try to write everything that can happen and you let the player deal with, with that and choose his path through all this. The thing is that you need to deal with the consequences mm -hmm. of the action. So if the player did this in this scene, maybe there will be repercussions later or in another scene. And you need to be careful about that. So it's a, it's a strange exercise. You just, it's, it's a gem. You just need to get used to it. Uh, the good thing is that you don't need to choose which version is the best, you can just write them all. Mm. But the bad, the bad side of this is that you end up with a huge script where you need to maintain the consistency and then your team hates you, usually. <laughs> and then, yeah, it's, it's, I don't know how many thousands of camera shots there are actually in Beyond, but, but it's, it's probably around 30 or 40,000 shots. How, how long was the filming process? So basically, it's a year in writing, a year in shooting, and when I say a year in shooting, it's shooting pretty much every day. So it's quite intense. Every day, and you're looking at 20 minutes a day, that sort of thing, 10 to 20? Yeah, but th there are many different things. You shoot dialogues during this year, but you also shoot stunts, you shoot walks, you shoot technical things, you shoot more acting parts. And, and then you have a year in editing, uh, balancing the game, adjusting gameplay, assembling basically the different pieces of the puzzle uh, with the hope that you didn't forgot one because if that's the case then, oh my god, pull back Suzanne, we, we need Ellen Page back. <laughs> and no, unfortunately it didn't happen because, but, but, but it's like, yeah, shooting um, thousands of small pieces, small parts, small pieces of a puzzle and in the last year you put everything together and then keep your fingers crossed that you didn't miss anything. So, with those things in mind, we've got um, a, a scenario that an audience can come in, we can play, we can have any number of eventual outcomes. So presumably then, any number of emotional responses to what that particular person experienced during that particular game, which is unique to them. Which sort of flies in the face of more traditional storytelling, which is the notion of somebody tells a story, it's that story, and we all experience the same story, and our responses might be different, but it's the same story. We then can talk about that. So then that story is a connecting network, a connective tissue amongst a community. So, Bruce, um, I thought I'd start with a heady introduction to you, and that was my attempt at it. Um, listening to David, and the notion of, I guess, you know, the, the history of cinema, and obviously there's avant-garde, and there's a, but, but let's say sort of your mainstream cinema, sure. which is, you know, let, let's confine ourselves to the sort of the hero's journey or, or that style of thing, you can usurp it however. But how does this storytelling match with traditional story, to storytelling in terms of an audience having a collective experience that they can share? Can they still share that? Um, and we'll get you to respond in a minute, because I know you'll have a, a situation. But what are your thoughts on that? I think right? it, it would have to be a different kind of collective experience, I think, because precisely what you said before, um, with cinema, I think we all inhabit uh, cinema communities of some kind. You know, and they might change over time, but I think for the most part, uh, so we have friends we talk to, right? Or we go to the movies with people, or we might be at home, or we might watch it on a laptop with people. But they seem, you know, there's this theory of little film communities that pop up in relation to particular films. I think with the game, what's really interesting uh, with something like this is that, on the one hand, uh, the experience is going to be individualized. I guess, and it's going to be quite specific to you. So I think that's really profound. You make the decisions um, that you invest yourself in, in quite a personal way into the experience. Um, I think, I mean, I'd be keen to hear what David uh, uh, has to say about the collective community, but I think there's still a framework where you can discuss the game with other people. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's possible, but you would have to discuss your particular version of that event. Mm. So cinema, for about 100 years, I think one of the richest parts of it is that you get the story, or the story, you get the cinema intact. It's there, you engage with it. Um, we might all watch Chinatown together. We might experience it differently, but Chinatown exists as one kind of coherent text. But in gaming, or in a game that's as ambitious as this, obviously that's not at all possible. So I guess what I'd be interested in is what are the other kinds of experiences that we get with these narratives 
that are no longer, as you say, sort of predetermined. Mm. You know, I'm not talking about nonlinear stuff. I'm talking this is not determined. You make the decision. You change stuff. Um, I don't know. I'd be interested to know. I don't know. Perhaps in the questions as well, what people think. But how does that community then kind of? form something and how do we all start talking about a game like this together if we experience it in quite radically different ways? Any responses? Yeah, what's really special with this kind of experiences is that actually it's a collaborative writing work between the writer and the player. So we really create the story together, uh, which is absolutely unique to this medium. I mean, no other medium can do this. Usually you're passive and you watch something that's been created and presented to you. And as you said, you can, your, your emotional response can vary, but the, the piece by itself is what it is. Here you can change it depending on who you are, what you think, what your emotions are, and this is what makes it really, really unique. And on Heavy Rain, I, 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 there are so many stories that I could tell you about what players told us about what it was to play uh, Heavy Rain. But basically, we had this, what we call the water cooler effect, yep. where people talking about their experience. And it was not just about talking like about a film where, did you like it? What did you think when this or that happened? Because basically, different players will have different stories. So there are moments that they may have seen or missed, depending on how they played. And the outcome may be totally different, which will give a totally different uh, meaning sometimes to the entire experience. So they're talking about the experience, the, their specific journey, and, um, and this is very, very uh, new and very exciting, and, and, and this is what is so fascinating about this medium. Can I ask one question in, in response to that? Yeah, okay. Uh, just <laughs> uh, just a, like, because I'm, I'm fascinated with the concept of interactive uh, experiences, uh, whether cinematic or whether in-game or, or some convergence. Um, I mean, for, for anyone, yeah, uh, because the, 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 the decisions that get made are often of a sort of binary nature, like do, you know, uh, I still saw a really great scene, you know, choose to kiss uh, yeah. Ellen Page or choose... We could reenact that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, or choose not to kiss Ellen Page. And I guess one question that I've, and, and, and I have to confess to not being a, a huge gamer, but I've played a fair few, and I guess the question I've got generally is, if the decisions are of a binary nature, in your writing uh, or, or in decision making of any kind, is there sort of um, a kind of schematic that has to be imposed on, you know, we can, yes, there's enormous freedom, but there are only sort of these places we can go because I have to say yes or no to this, or choose this or that. Okay, um, good question. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, you need to explain a little bit how exactly this thing works because basically I'm not creating an experience where anything can happen. You cannot change everything in the story and decide to kill the guy instead of kissing him, for example. I mean, the rule that I impose to myself is really I want to let the player do whatever is consistent with the characterization and with the context of the story. So. Jodie Holmes cannot do in the game anything that she wouldn't do as a character. And this is the rule that you try to create. And you need to have these rules because otherwise, uh, where are the limits? You can write anything and, and most of all the player can ruin the story, which is counterproductive. You just want him to, to go on with the story and experience something unique and special. So you need to create this narrative space with kind of invisible boundaries that he may just find as rarely as possible and just make whatever seems you know logical to him and see the logical consequences of his actions and see the story unfolding in a very consistent way and this is the type of experience that you want to create but actually you cannot decide to slap the face of the guy instead of kissing him or not kissing him for example just because in the context it doesn't make any sense. So there are some rules that you need to establish like this, where you need to play, and there is a little bit of smoking mirrors behind it, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. It's not just pure magic. I mean, there are techniques, and uh, you just try to make the technique invisible mm -hmm. as much as possible. In a sense, that goes actually back to um, you know, classic old storytelling. I mean, just to digress, the Arthurian legends, as originally written by Mallory, La Morte Arthur, were structured in that fashion, weren't they? Each chapter would come, and there was pretty much a binary decision to be made by a knight 
um, in each chapter. And each decision in and of itself would seem simple and you'd think, oh, okay, that's got to be the way. But put uh, a number of those binary decisions back to back to back to back to back and all of a sudden you find yourself in this world where, which is complex and driven and pointed because you have been, um, you've said yes to that, yes to that, no to that and all of a sudden you now don't know exactly which way forward. Mm. Um, yeah, because the permutations get so big. I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I, I then wanted to, um, so looking at, and again we sort of talked about older storytelling, newer storytelling. With regards to, I mean this is such a visual medium and, and it looks spectacular by the way. Congratulations and congratulations I must ask you to pass on to your technical team and, and the <laughs> cinematographers and crews, grips, I love those guys. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a, you know, I do, I, every time I see a, a shot like that I'm like oh my god what they've done and all these guys and there's a few people in this room actually that look like a few of the people on the screen so I'm not sure whether you know just the, the people just creating <laughs> these things. So congratulations on the look of it what are the, the kind of things that are coming together from game and movie? What are the best of each platforms that you're bringing to this? And, and I might then sort of get you to respond and, and then Nick, fast forwarding your career mm. 10 years when you've got your own place in Paris and hundreds of piece of people <laughs> at your disposal, how might you, what, what are some of the things that you'd like to look at? Sure. David? Um, to start with the idea of the, the best things from each... each well, um, actually, we have, with, with cinema, we have a lot in common and we have some differences. Mm. I mean, what we have in common is basically the fact that we try to um, trigger emotions through images and, and, um, and we use the same things. We use actors, we use um, dialogue, script, cameras, light. Um, so for this aspect, I really try to learn from films, how films do it. And I try to learn that because it took one century to films to do it that way, um, in a very, very efficient way. I don't want to spend one century learning it, so I just <laughs> you know, watch films and try to learn the, the film, filmic language because it saves me time. But at the same time, games are not just films, actually. Um, there is this extra dimension called interactivity and um, how the story is played and how we play with the interface and how all this becomes a part of the immersion of the player, how we establish this relationship with the, the player uh, that is really about you know, putting you in the shoes of the character, how all this thing works. This is something that we need to invent. So we are right now kind of pioneering this because there is no established rules. We just make the rules uh, game after game. And Sometimes we find rules that are very valid and that we reuse and sometimes it just doesn't work and we need to find something else. But we invent the interactive language right now, which is so exciting. Mm -hmm. Nick, um, from a, a younger filmmaker looking forward, the things that you're passionate about telling stories for now, how might you embed them in a gaming format in five, Yeah, look, I think five? it's a really interesting time because games have been pushing towards film for a while now. If you look at some of the new releases, they're, they're massive now. They kind of approach it from a marketing point of view. And also when you're playing the game, the cinematic elements of them are getting longer and the actual gameplay is getting shorter and you're kind of playing through this film. Um, and games, I think, too, are going that way. So they're kind of like coming together and in the middle is something like this, where you've got a very cinematic, you know, it's from a script that's been cast there's you know, lighting and all these little things that you take into consideration when you're making a film, it's all, it's all in the game. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you take the best from both worlds, even if you're making a film remembering that there's an audience and you want them to invest in your characters and invest in your story, and the same with the film, I think it's all got to come back to the story. The story that you're telling and the people that you're, you're telling it to and getting them to invest, whether it be through interactivity, um, flashy uh, CGI, whatever it is, you've got to get the people to buy in. And for me, it's like, well, whatever works. Mm -hmm. Whatever works. So whatever I can use to do that to get you to buy into my characters and to, to take something away from it, yeah, I mean, whatever works. I can just use it, <laughs> in short. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, so Suzanne, I saw you nodding vigorously when he was uh, saying it's all about the story. It's all about the story. And, and having spoken to you uh, in the lead up to this, you've clearly enjoyed your time with David. 
Um, I, I just might ask before we throw over to the audience for questions. Um, Obviously, in Australia, if you want to make a film that um, costs more than uh, $900,000, you really need to cast it with some actors that'll get you a little bit of money through, through the door. If there are people in the audience now that are thinking, I've got a great idea for a game, um, and I just need to cast Jeffrey Rush, or I just need to cast a big American name, what advice could you give uh, to these hopefuls in the audience that want to create their own massive franchise in gaming? How do people interact with the actors? How do we get in touch with actors? And what are the sorts of conversations you might start with an actor to get th that business going? It's hard. I mean, <laughs> you have to have, it's, as I was nodding vigorously at, it's about a story. It's about character-driven material. And David has written, a, you know, this was what's so funny. I didn't have a lick of page to show anybody. I had an idea that was David's, that was kind of basically the overall, but no script. The script doesn't go out. So it was telling, this is what the story is. This is the idea from this brilliant man who's made these other projects. Come meet and let him tell you now about it. And that's how he got these actors. It wasn't from the material itself, it was the bigger telling of it, like he has with us today. And wanting these actors to say, I want to be a part of that. That's, it's having that kind of material to really draw them in. And this is the first video game that stars actors of this caliber in such a visual way. Let's talk about that, because uh, there is, um, we were talking earlier about Sam Worthington mm -hmm. in Call of Duty. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So, big star. But it actually what's the only his voice. So, but, yeah, well, there's a bit of faith, but what's the difference? Because it's, I mean, it is quite different. In your view, though, what, what is the difference between what you've managed to achieve with your actors and the scan, the, 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 what's come before? They did a, he did a small, I think a small part in a voice. Mm -hmm. He could have done even more, but I, I, I I think it was mostly just his voice interaction. He didn't necessarily want to do the motion capture of it. They may have done a scan of him, who looks so much like him. <laughs> um, and then um, Gary Oldman is also the voice of another one in Call mm -hmm. of Duty. And I think they did just a scan of his face, but it's not the whole, the whole piece. It's not him acting these scenes out. It's his voice. And, and David, you, you mentioned earlier that you went to quite some pains to try and remove everything um, from the environment so that the actor could act. So you're talking about trying to get rid of all the big bulky things and the lights. So that was something that you're really quite sensitive to, being alive in the moment. Well, the thing is there are different games that have different needs for actors. So uh, we, we don't pretend here that any single game need great actors. If you do a tennis game, I mean, maybe you don't need such great Atari actors. Atari was fantastic and that yeah, didn't so, make the little... And the actors were okay mm. <laughs> this one. But no, act actually, we create experiences that are really based on storytelling and emotions. We need great actors because just because this is the heart of the experience, if you don't have that, you don't have much. Mm. So you need the good story and you need the empathy for the character and the, and the, and the talent. Um, but yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a big difference between just having voices over and having this type of involvement because this type of experience really needs uh, a real creative involvement from the actors. It's not just about going to a sound booth and recording exactly. something for two hours. It's weeks of shooting. Um, so, um, so that was a real creative collaboration. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you've noticed in the, well, I guess it's not here, but it says, Ellen Page. Oh, the opening credits, I'm an yes. actor, it was the first thing I noticed. Even, that's never <laughs> happened before in yeah. a video game. Yeah, big strong names that, that up really the top. That really makes it so it, cinematic. Exactly, it feels it, so you know, cinematic it that way. It as something, even the, the poster, when mm -hmm. I saw it, I thought, well, what differentiates this from a cinema poster? And then it said sort of PS3 at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what, can I just ask one quick, quick of, of all you guys, you talk about film style or cinematic style. And so if we're talking about it's, if, you know, if we put aside story for a second, and because there's such freedom in this medium, you have to make a lot of decisions 
about how, you, even though you're not filming it in the traditional sense, but how is it going to look? And so I was really intrigued when you said, well, you, you, you look at cinema and you think, well, look, this can show me. And I guess one of the things I'm interested in is right now in cinema, if we stick with the mainstream, there's such a, 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 a sort of contestation about what cinema should look like. You know, so that if you're going to do an action scene, you can do it in a very sort of classical Hollywood style, or you can do a Michael Bay action scene. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm interested in when you said, you know, I was looking to cinema to, um, do you think there's a lot at stake in, in not only what you're doing, but, you know, gaming generally, if it's drawing on cinema to, to kind of, you know, make these big choices about this is the kind of cinema we, will, we want it to look like? Well, you know, at the moment we try to make games that don't look like video games. This is really what we try to achieve first. This is our first mission. And, and you know, a classic example of this is that uh, having cameras moving is something very easy, uh, very cheap uh, in video games. You, if you want a crane shot, you just place your camera up and that's it, you got your crane shot. If you want a crane shot on a film set, that's a different story. So because everything is cheap in a game and easy and fast, we tended to have our cameras moving like this all the time and moving in and out and on the side for no reason, just because we could do it. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we tried to fix is to say, look, if we want to have this camera moving, there must be a reason. Mm -hmm. In the filmic language, there must be a reason for it to move and it's not because it's easy that we should just make it move. Mm -hmm. So this is exactly where we are. We just try to understand the rules and apply them. Then there will be a second stage where maybe we will start to see people having a, a style in filming. Honestly, I don't think we are at that stage yet but in that's games. that's something for the future. I mean, we were talking a bit about this yeah. before, an alter gamer, you know, where there's a, a genuine style. Not, not just narrative, but, you know, authors kind of, you know, cut their teeth on framing, mise-en-scene, that kind exactly. of thing. We're just so that at, would be amazing. We're just that at the happen. beginning now. Yeah. Because the tools are here to do it. It's just that we don't master the medium yet. Yeah. So we try to do simple things first. And once we'll fully master the simple things, then we will try, if we have the talent, mm -hmm. to go further and have a specific style. And if you look at cinema, it had the first films were on cameras as big as this room, so they couldn't move them. <laughs> and now you've got yeah. GoPros that you can stick all over people. So cinema kind of evolved, yeah. the cinematic language has evolved, and that's what we're used to as an audience. So utilising those tools is what we're used to seeing. Yeah. But I guess the challenge you would have had was that you started with the GoPros. You know, you could just <laughs> yeah. go anywhere and do anything, which is great, exactly. fun, but yeah. It's sort of like a steady cam, steady, steady cam. Yeah. Everything's, everything's like, just, you know, <laughs> every shot's got to be a, a yeah. complex steady cam shot. Yeah. yeah, and it's even a little bit more complex than that because uh, we don't have optics, okay? Mm. So we can play with the lenses the way we want. We can play with the depth of field the way we want. And with real cameras, these two parameters are linked. Mm. You cannot have any depth of field with any lens, but we can. So you can have things that are just look horrible, absolutely ugly, and, and doesn't make any sense for anyone who know what a, how a camera works, but we can do it. Mm -hmm. So now the thing we try to learn is, okay, okay, how can we use lenses and depth of field in a way that it makes sense? So just we respect the language and we don't use any lens in any situation. Because in the past we had huge lenses and we were making close shots with them which look just absolutely horrible and doesn't make any sense and no one does it unless you have a very serious reason to do it. But yeah, we did it because we didn't know. So actually we learn. We learn about cinema, we learn about cameras, we learn about editing with one specificity, which is that, again, there is not only one director. We are only the co-director with the player because depending on what the player does and how he wants to play with his character and with the camera, he participates to the directing. So it's a collaboration work again. Mm -hmm. And we need to find more clever way to create a better experience while giving some space to the player. Is that the ultimate um, in, in uh, letting ownership go? I know a lot of directors, uh, and I don't know many of them that like calling themselves co-directors, especially with the person that's about to pay a certain amount of money to walk in and watch their film. Like the idea of letting that go would just <laughs> make them feel <laughs> sick. So is that, um, I mean, the, the notion of collaboration, you've got a, a stunning number of people working with you on this. And then to finish it all up, is there, do you think, I guess it's hard to know, is there an extra fear factor as you throw it out to the public and let them 
choose their story? Or is it more exciting? Um, both, I guess. I don't know if there is an extra fear factor compared to a, um, a film director releasing his film and, and just being anxious at the reaction of the public. But this is, this is the scariest part of my job because making the game is a lot of work and you, it's, it's really crazy amount of work. Um, you have 200 people working on this thing for three years and um, the final result is translated into 23 languages including Chinese and, and, and Polish and whatever, Finnish and whatever languages. But it's really a big machinery basically and every, everybody turns to you when they have a question like how should we do this, well, what about this, and what about the music, and what about the camera, what about the lighting? And you're the only person at the head of this big ship in a way. So um, there is this tension but the worst part is definitely when you're done with the game and you just, you're, you're going to let people play with your thing and see what, what they think. Mm. And this is exactly where I am right now. <laughs> and this is bloody scary. I'm well, you. that feels like a fantastic moment to uh, throw this discussion over to our audience. And, um, and you can, I guess, if you want, increase David's fear factor tenfold by really putting him on the spot right now. <laughs> Um, of course, we've got um, uh, our other three guests. So um, I've got some uh, questions here that were sent in earlier um, through the Facebook um, community. So I can go to here, but I'd so much prefer to honour the energy of everybody in the room uh, that came here. So does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask about anything that they've seen uh, here today? I'll obviously take personal questions as well. Um, I can't start with you, Andrew, because I know you and that would be favouritism. <laughs> so I'll come to you third. Uh, so up the back, first hand up with the glasses. Yes, if you could um, just uh, wait to grab that microphone. Hi, my name is Karel Seegers. I read this morning that um, the creator of Breaking Bad said that the worst thing the French have given us is auteur cinema. <laughs> when, I, when I hear this, I'm really inspired and it, it feels very much like a very personal project, <laughs> something that is David Cage. To what degree do you feel that you are the auteur? You know, it's very difficult to do things and to look at you doing things in a way and to judge what you're doing. So uh, um, I, I don't ask myself this kind of questions. I, I try to write something, it's true, that is personal. But at the same time, if I'm the only person on earth being interested in these characters and, and this story, then there is a problem. So I try to talk about things that I find moving with the hope that other people out there will find it moving too. And uh, do, you can call it auteur, auteur's work or not. Honestly, it's not that important to me. And I think people should be careful about general statement in general, you know, just saying, oh, this is shit and this is good. This. No, I mean, each, each type of work is different and brings something uh, interesting and unique and inspiring for other people. So. Um, so there, yeah, that's the situation. I don't know what I'm doing. Is the, is the uh, short answer? And <laughs> um, there was a question right there in front, sir. How did the uh, feedback from Heavy Rain affect your production process on this? Did it change dramatically from that? Thing? You know, the thing is, if Heavy Rain had been a complete disaster, then probably it would have changed my mind. But actually, you try not to be too influenced by, by the feedback, because otherwise, you start to you become a marketing person. You say, OK, I got my, you know, my, my list of things that people wanted or didn't want, and I'm just going to tick the boxes until I try to make them happy. But this is not how I work, and I don't think any creative person can work that way. You just do what you believe in, where you go where your instinct leads you, and in the hope that you're not completely wrong. Um, so yeah, I was inspired by everything players told me about their experience playing Heavy Rain. That was amazing. And still today, three years after the game's been released, there are still people telling me uh, about what happened to them in Heavy Rain in a very personal way, as if it was something that happened to them in, in their real life, <laughs> which, which is really surprising. And this is great, and I can feel this, I, I find this very inspiring. Um, but at the same time, yeah, some people like this and they don't like that. And okay, fair enough. Now let me try something else. Let me try another direction and see if I can do better this time. And um, so that's it. Andrew? Uh, 
Andrew Urban from Urban Cinephile, David. Um, it seems to me that I'm a writer, so um, uh, this is said with great respect. It seems to me that you're in the position that uh, a Christian God was in when he created the Garden of Eden and he gave Adam and Eve an option to do free will, to do whatever they liked. And that's what you've done. Now, in the story of Adam and Eve, we have Adam and Eve, we have the serpent, we have the God. And you could write several stories with different endings, making each one a different goody and baddie. I'm curious about the process when you sit down to write a story. Do you think about the options of the endings and how to get there? Okay. Uh, what I need to explain here is that it's not just about having different endings in the end, like it would be linear and then suddenly you have 10 choices leading to different conclusions. Actually, each scene can be played in many different ways. So you have many different possibilities, different combinations, different actions, having different consequences, telling slightly different stories that will lead you to different conclusions. So it's, it's, it's a big... It's really a narrative space, as I said, and I, I, well, the way I see things is that a film script is 2D, it's through time and space, where uh, uh, a game script is 3D, it's time, space and interactivity, which makes it m more dense and, and more complex in a way. So. There are many technical challenges, one of them being to make sure that whatever path the player chooses, he still has a, a pleasant, interesting, consistent story. And to make sure that there is not, oh, a very good story, a very good path, giving a very good story, and a very bad path where you have terrible storytelling. You need all paths, all possibilities, all journeys to be equally good, but different. And, and that's for me the main, the main difficulty, the main challenge. And um, you know on Heavy Rain, you could, it's, it's an investigation and you can finish the game with all characters alive and saving the kid or all characters dead and the, the kid being killed. And, and, and all possible variations between these two extremes. And actually, um, people had all these variations and, and I hope that they had good stories, even if everybody died and they didn't find the murder. It's just a different story. So for me, that's, that's the real challenge. It's got to be you. a Samuel Beckett story. Um, yes, right there. Uh, yes, yes. And then you, madam. So, yep, fellow with the thing first, yep. Hello. <laughs> yes, and then you, over there. You guys all talked a lot about um, how uh, cinema affected video games, but I'd, I'd really be interested to see you know, video games have been around for a long time. How have video games now affected cinema? Uh, I, might, uh, I might just give David a rest for a moment. Um, Bruce, you were chatting um, about yeah, that earlier. I mean, so uh, why don't you kick that off and then David, if you could round it out. Um, I, I, I think, you know, I, I think the last 20 years has, uh, has shown us that uh, these kinds of big industries are gonna increasingly converge for all sorts of different reasons. Um, the movie that, that, that really indicated to me that, that people were consciously thinking this uh, was Inception, uh, because I thought that was based on such a clear idea of goal orientation in the film, and including levels. And, and so it, in, in that sense, there was a kind of, you know, there, there was a kind of movement through Inception that on the one end was absolutely traditional cinematic. Inception is a very traditional film um, and, and really ticks every single box of a classical uh, 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 Hollywood film. Um, but in other ways, I think what it did interestingly was it seemed to um, put you in the position of a game player at, 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 at interesting moments. You know, choices that Cobb had to make or I had to shift, I had to accomplish this to get to the next level and, and so on. Um, so I think there are, there, are, there are more obvious kinds of uh, uh, interventions, you know, and convergences, but I think there are really subtle things happening where filmmakers are starting to think also through the framework of gaming. And I think it's impossible not to. You know, we are immersed in a culture where you and I in one day can watch TV, uh, watch a movie, and I can turn on a game, you know, all in the same entertainment unit. So I mean, it's impossible that these texts are not gonna, you know, sort of bleed into each other in, in interesting ways. I think the goal is that we get something really rich out of it and not something that is, is completely dumbed down you know, in, in, in any of the industries. Um, 
Yeah. Um, have you had a moment, David, or anyone on the panel, where you've gone in to a, to a movie, watching a movie, and had one of those, oh, that's ours <laughs> moment, where you look at it and thought, oh, they've got that straight out of, out of our game? It, yeah, it happened to me. <laughs> where uh, when I see some directors playing with the with the camera in a way like this is really gratuitous. I mean, there is no yeah. reason for you to do this except to show that your camera can really do this and go through things. And you say, why? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some v excellent directors did that just to show that they could do it. But it's really it's a very interesting question actually, and it's. Um, there are two aspects to it. When I read film, some film reviews, usually when the film is terribly bad, some critics write, oh, it's as bad as a video game. So basically, that's the worst thing you can get in a film is something that would be like a video game. <laughs> and that's, that, when you read this, you see what they mean, because it's full of movements and, and violence and, and just jumping all over the place, so you see what they mean. At the same time, it's a bit frustrating when you're a game director saying, well, wait a minute, I mean, there are different things in our industry that are also interesting. But at the same time, all these guys, all these young directors, including our friend here, they are film directors, but wait a minute, they play video games. They were, you know, born and raised with video games, so it's impossible that it's not a part of their culture in a way or another. So of course games have an influence on the work, uh, consciously or unconsciously. Mm, definitely creeps in. When I first started playing video games, they would release a video game after the movie. So the movie would kick off the video game, but the next wave, once all the comic books wrap up, it's going to be games. That's what they'll be making films on. So it's kind of gone full circle. And just on a film that felt like a video game, I don't know if anyone's seen The Raid, but that was just the most intense, that felt like a video game. You kick the bottom door in, got to get to the top, kill everything in the middle. <laughs> it was done really well, don't get me wrong, it was rad, but that was about <laughs> as video game as a film, just off the, you know, just thinking of one that really felt like, that showed him and his wife for about two seconds at the start to get some emotion in there. They kind of just went, oh yeah, he's got a wife, cool, get in the tower and beat everyone up. And they didn't even come back to her at the end. It wasn't even a Aww. thing. It was just like a, for four seconds, it kind of went, it's a film, gotcha. And then it was just pop, 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 pop. It was masterfully done though. Um, it could have gone the other way, but I think, yeah, it's sort of been films inspired video games or kicked off that and now it's come all the way back around. Just quickly to follow up on that, um, is there a game that you remember that you, you think now, oh, if you had the opportunity to turn any of your favourite games into a film, what would it be? There's one that I really want to turn into a film. And you can't tell us because... And I can't tell you. And, yeah, but yeah. it was a tiny little independent game made in really simple graphics. It's so basic, mm. but the story is so good. It's incredible. And I command the movie. Well, <laughs> Pong. Pong. <laughs> Antagonist, protagonist. Oh, look at that, oh, back and forth all day long. It's just so long. simple. And it's just the rhythm yeah. of the dialogue. Can't believe uh, no one's done it. So, sorry, madam? Hi, Talitha Hi. here from Beyond Screen Production in Sydney. Uh, I'm just wondering why you chose to screen it at Tribeca. Was it just for marketing? Um... Actually, um, it was, uh, I think the people at Tribeca uh, heard about the game and um, obviously they knew my work on Heavy Rain and this is how the discussion started and um, they were interested in making it a, a, a part of the official film festival and what they told me is that they, are, they were interested in the future of storytelling under all forms and they thought that this game was one of the many things they, that, that would be good to talk about. So this is how it started. You know, I'm not saying we're not making any marketing, but actually um, we didn't choose the, the actors, for example, just because of marketing. The, the, the first and, and main reason to have Ellen Page and William Dafoe was their contribution to their creative collaboration. And, and many things like this happened on this game just because we met and we, we realized that we shared, you know, a passion for for this form of storytelling, and this is how Tri Tribeca happened. This is how we started working with Hans Zimmer on the soundtrack, um, and th that's basically the story around Beyond. 
Uh, right up the back. I got you. And I've just got time for uh, two more questions. So I do apologise for those of you that uh, haven't had a chance. We'll try and we'll see how we go, but I think we're starting to get close. Yeah. Um, obviously, with next gen coming out, do you find that will change the way you develop your games, or you know, like write the stories or the interaction levels? So you know, obviously with um, PlayStation with the eye camera on PS4 and the Connect on Xbox One. Well, the the technology evolves uh, very fast. I mean, uh, there's really a, a massive visual gap between a PlayStation 3 and a PlayStation 4. And we worked on a short, maybe you you saw it called the Dark Sorcerer. Just to, it, it was a quick test, uh, and it's definitely not the the, the the cutting edge quality you can get. It was just dirt and, and, and quick test of what we can do on a PlayStation 4, and we were really surprised by the gap that we could get. But at the same time, what is important to me is that how interesting is it if we just have if we just create the same games just with more polygons? then okay, it's great to have more power, but if it doesn't change actually the experiences that we create, then what's the point? So my hope is that we're going to use this great power we now have on these next-gen consoles to create games that you have never played before and maybe break some of the traditional paradigms about you know, video games, invent new ideas, and hopefully try to create games that, are, that become meaningful games that have something to say and not just games where there, are, there is someone to kill. Uh, this is really what I'm looking for. And, and, and you feel th this is the beginning of that journey for you? Oh, uh, uh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying this is it and we are the only ones. There are many people trying many different, very different directions. Um, and, and that's what's so exciting about this medium is that we are really story driven. We, we like stories and we want to explore this possibility, but there are other people trying different things, and sometimes it's not story driven, but it's still very emotional uh, in many different ways. I'm a big fan of a company called That Game Company. They're doing uh, Flowers and, and Journey, um, and uh, for example, uh, but they are, I, I also like a Japanese creator called uh, Ueda. Fumito Ueda is a fantastic creator, really a sense of poetry that is quite unique, very different from what we do. Uh, there are many people out there doing great things. What's very interesting is that we see something happening right now with big AAA titles, uh, with big budgets, uh, big teams, a lot of marketing money and marketing and development money, not taking many risks in, on a creative point of view just because there's so much money and investment involved that they can't take creative risks. And on the other side of the spectrum, we see very small companies, indie developers. Um, they don't have money. They, they don't have you know, this big marketing budget. So they need to be creative. And actually, these people invent the future of the industry maybe more than the AAA titles because they need to be creative. They need to invent new things. And this is what's exciting right now in this industry. It's more the indie developers maybe than the AAA. But it's yeah. not so far away from cinema. It's, say, it's exactly the same thing. Same thing. Exactly the same thing. Well, that uh, sorry. Oh, I was going to say that with the the graphics things a really good point because CG doesn't replace story and films suffer from that as well. A two hundred million dollar budget doesn't guarantee a good film. Yeah. So that's a that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> so that seems that uh, we have uh, you know. A reasonable consensus on the panel. That doesn't happen very often. I do apologise for those of you that didn't get to ask a question, but I thought that was a, a nice place to leave it, thinking about, um, uh, I guess, the breadth of people in this space um, that are talking about th th these sorts of things. Um, also, uh, the developers without much money, the creativity to get around, um, not having the budgets that other people have, uh, and the notion that there are people all around the world um, looking at these things, trying to create experiences um, to offer uh, their audience uh, something new. Uh, and that fills me with some joy, the notion that there are people all over the world um, looking to surprise us uh, over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Because as we know, surprise is one of the most joyous things in our lives. So friends, um, that does bring us uh, to a close. You can continue this conversation on Twitter with uh, hashtag beyond the game. Um, so please, uh, if you'd like to uh, converse with each other in the Twitter sphere, please use hashtag beyond the game. But 
knowing a group like this, you'll do whatever you want and we can't stop you. So um, that's okay as well. Friends, um, if you could uh, give a warm round of applause. And thank you very much, all of you, for giving your time. We really appreciate it. Uh, you, you added to the conversation no end. So Bruce Isaac, thank you so much for coming. Nick Clifford, thank you. Uh, Suzanne, thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of, our of applause, Mr. David Cave.